some introductory remarks by Professor Friedman, uh, who is uh, the William Joseph Meyer Professor of Political Economy at Harvard University. He will speak for around 20 minutes. And then 25. 25, OK. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Your credit is out. <laughs> and um, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, as discussant, we have uh, first Lorenzo Viniz Maggi, who has been previously of this parish as an executive board mm. member, and now is the chairman of uh, Societe Generale. And then Panikos Demetriades, who is from University of Leicester, but also previously a governing council member as the governor of the Central Bank of Cyprus. Uh, we'll both intervene for seven minutes, and I think that's the agreement we had. And we need to finish on time, so I would really urge you to uh, be uh, as concise as you can. Uh, but Professor Friedman, uh, let's start with you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ferdinando. It's an enormous pleasure to join in honoring Ignacio on this occasion. Uh, Ignacio is a person who uniquely has uh, made two quite different contributions to uh, this extraordinary institution. Uh, both last night and already this morning, we've heard a lot about Ignacio's contributions to the realm of bank supervision and regulation. I won't need to elaborate those, but let me uh, remind everyone that Ignacio was here before and at a very crucial period together with uh, several other people, I think, for example, of Atmar Ising, I think, for example, of Tommaso uh, Padua Schiopa. Uh, Ignacio played a fundamental role in devising the monetary policy strategy of the ECB. This was an enormous contribution for which not just everyone at the bank, but everyone in Europe should be uh, grateful. So, Ignacio, uh, congratulations to you on your two sets of uh, extraordinary accomplishments, and it's a great pleasure to join in honoring you today. Now, uh, I want to talk about implications of the current populism for central banks. I want to make three sets of introductory remarks. First, I want to say why I do not regard what we are seeing today in many of our countries, my own included, as genuine populism. Think of it as ersatz populism, so-called populism. I want to say why. Second, I want to use just a few examples from my own country to indicate that the adversarial relationship between populism and central banks is nothing new. Uh, there is a very long history of this kind of adversarialism and I see no reason to expect it to abate. And third, I want to address the question of whether the problems that stand behind the current so-called populism are of central banks making. And the conclusion I'm going to offer is that it doesn't really matter. Central banks frequently have to deal with problems that they have not created, and I think this is one. Then I want to go on and address in turn a series of uh, areas of central banking responsibility, monetary policy, uh, supervision and regulation, last resort lending, and finally the governance and legitimacy of central banks, and consider each in turn to establish whether today's so-called populism has already uh, created uh, problems for central banks, but to contemplate whether it will in the future, even if it hasn't already. So first place, why do I not regard this uh, movement in so many of our countries today as legitimate uh, populism? To be sure, today's agitation shares a number of uh, features with legitimate uh, historical populism. Uh, there is the resentment of perceived elites, where we have to be very careful because uh, the notion of who is and who is not among the elite is very much in the eye of the beholder. Uh, 
And uh, my sense is that the elites who are resented today are very much those associated with education and expertise. And this, of course, has a bearing on central banks and central banking. There is the antipathy toward established authority in many of our countries. Uh, this takes a variety of forms playing out not merely in the political arena. There is a disaffection from the uh, established political parties in many of these countries. And of course, that has different implications in different uh, countries. In many European countries, Germany, for example, uh, it's relatively easy to start a new political party. Uh, in my country, it's almost impossible uh, to do that. Uh, in, uh, had, had Trump been German, he presumably would have started something like the AFD. In the United States, that's uh, difficult, and so instead he did a hostile takeover of one of the existing political parties. Not that that was easy, but it was easier than trying to create a new party. And then finally, and I would say most regrettably, one of the features that today's so-called populism shares with genuine populism throughout uh, history and in many of our countries are the ugly pathologies uh, ranging from nationalism, uh, nativism, xenophobia, racism, religious bigotry, uh, in all of our countries, both the movements and the political parties that have uh, indulged in um, populism all willingly wallow in these pathologies. And no one knows where this will go and how far it, uh, has, uh, how far it will proceed. But in many of our countries, uh, we all know where this has led in the past. Now, if all of these features of today's agitation are in common with historical populism, why then uh, do I not regard this as legitimate uh, populism? And the answer is that today's populists in most of the countries that I am aware of have no serious program for uh, taking initiatives that would redound to the benefit of economically disadvantaged citizens. And at least historically, that has been the core of populism in one country after another. This is not to say that the measures that populists have historically advocated have uniformly been uh, correct or that they would have, if adopted, uh, have had the effect that they uh, were intended for them. Many of these pop countries, uh, populist groups historically, have, have favored misguided policies. Nonetheless, there was at least something there. And my survey of the countries in Europe and in the, sort of my own country uh, today is that there is simply no serious uh, program. And I think that's a great difference from historical populism. And it's also fair to say that today's uh, populists are uh, attacking the central banking community, here I have in mind especially monetary policy making, from the opposite direction. Historically, populism has been opposed to tight money policy. Uh, today, many of the so-called populists are opposed to easy money policy. Now, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the minutiae of my own country's financial history, but I would just like to, uh, uh, perhaps the slide speaks for itself. We have had many, many examples of the interaction between populism and uh, central banking in my uh, country. Uh, we had a central bank very early under Alexander Hamilton, that was the Bank of the United States in 1791. It was allowed to go out of business when its 20-year charter expired in 1811. Uh, it, simply, they didn't have enough votes in the Senate to renew the charter. Uh, many of us uh, think of Jefferson in a positive light, but I certainly do. But one of Jefferson's great mistakes was to oppose the uh, renewal of the first bank charter. Uh, 
there was then a second central bank started in 1816. Uh, the charter ran out 20 years later in 1836. This time they had the votes to renew it and did in the Congress. And Andrew Jackson famously vetoed it. It was the leading issue in the second term of Jackson's presidency. My country then went for three-fourths of a century without a central bank, not because no, no one ever thought of creating a third one. Many people did, but there simply wasn't enough support. Then in the 1880s and the 1890s, we had what we regard in the United States as populism with a capital P, that is, there was actually a populist uh, party in which people like William Jennings Bryan famously opposed the gold standard. Uh, what many people don't remember, however, is that Bryan was not just a populist. When he ran for president in 1896, he ran as a Democrat. And the famous cross of gold speech was his acceptance speech, accepting the nomination of the Democratic Party uh, for, uh, for president uh, when he ran or at, 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 its, uh, at the nominating convention in Chicago. Then there was Wright Patman, the great uh, leader, chairman of the House Banking Committee throughout the 20s and 30s and on into the 40s, uh, who took great pride in having run Andrew Mellon out of office as the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the history, uh, Wright Patman's uh, most famous uh, economic proposition was that the way to fight inflation is to lower interest rates. I'll say that again. The way to fight inflation was to lower interest rates because high interest rates were a cost of doing business for debted, indebted companies, and the a uh, company would have to pass that cost th along in the price it chose in, it, uh, chose in the product market. Uh, eerily, in the United States, we are now hearing some echo of right patmanism uh, Paul Volcker uh, had a uh, uh, running battle with a Texas firm called Lone Star Industries in the construction uh, business when uh, Paul finally broke the back of American uh, inflation. Uh, for those old enough to remember, Lone Star Industries used to run full page ads in the Wall Street Journal once a week, uh, criticizing uh, Paul Volcker personally and his uh, policies. Uh, by coincidence, I happened to be working at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in the summer of, I think, 1979 when this enormous truck pulled up in front of the building, not on the Constitution Avenue side, but at the C Street side, and there was this enormous flatbed truck full of lumber uh, with, that was sent, uh, to, um, sent to Paul uh, personally as chairman of the Federal Reserve, and the note that came with it said, Dear Paul, here, I can't use this anymore. You take it. This was uh, Lone Star Industries' protest against uh, policy. And then I deliberately picked two examples to indicate that this is not necessarily a partisan thing. There have been Democratic uh, populists and Republican populists. Now, finally, by way of, by way of uh, introduction, I want to say something about whether the problems that are fueling today's populism are of central banks making. My answer is mostly no. We are all familiar with issues like slow productivity growth, widening uh, inequality uh, in America, increasing poverty. In Europe, you don't have poverty because you avoid that, but we don't. We do have poverty. Uh, strains from globalization. We're all familiar with these uh, uh, phenomena, and they are not of central banks making. Nonetheless, I think uh, central bankers would be too complacent to think that they have played no role. The place to begin is that uh, the fiction that we all endlessly repeat that monetary policy is distributionally neutral is just that, it is a fiction. And regardless of how many times we proclaim it, it turns out not to be true. Uh, 
almost all elements of monetary policy, whether interest rate policy, as asset purchase programs, last resort lending, all have very significant distributional effects. And in many countries, these distributional effects are part of what today's uh, anti-central bank crowd uh, objects to. Now, there's a, le a legitimate uh, analytical question of whether central banks' emphasis on price stability has stunted economic growth. I won't go into this issue. One could have an entire conference on that. In short, the analytical question turns on whether there is either an actual <clears throat> or a perceived nonlinearity in, in either the Phillips curve relationship or in central bank preferences. Either one, if the asymmetry goes in the uh, nonlinearity goes in the right direction. Either one would mean that an emphasis on price stability stunts growth. Um, again, there may or may not be such a bias. And finally, here in Europe, I, my sense is that part of the problem is that uh, for reasons we all can understand, the uh, ECB has allowed itself to become part of the enforcement mechanism of the process whereby reckless lenders in the uh, northern countries, uh, instead of taking their losses, exploit financially and economically the borrowers in the southern countries. And I think this is a very unfortunate uh, role for any central bank to play. Either way, however, whether the central banks themselves are the cause of the problems that are fueling uh, today's so-called populism doesn't matter because frequently central banks have to deal with problems that are not of their own making. So now let's do a quick review of the state of play in these four areas of central banking. First, classical monetary policy. Uh, at least in most of the countries that I follow carefully, uh, I would say that <clears throat> there has not yet been any distortion of the interest rate setting uh, policies of central banks coming from populist uh, pressure. Now, the one area in which I think there would be pressure would be if central banks were to try to coordinate their policies uh, internationally. Uh, as I'm guessing everybody is aware, however, it is not at all clear that central banks should actually do this. There is a very large and well-developed literature of coordination of monetary policies internationally, and I think the fair, uh, fair estimate is that that literature has been and will remain inconclusive. And therefore, whether, uh, the, whether today's movements would prevent such an uh, effort by central banks is not at all clear. On balance sheet policy, however, the story is very different. And already in many countries, there has been uh, enormous opposition from exactly the quarters that we're discussing to the uh, asset purchase programs. And uh, in part, this has come from fallacious, uh, old-fashioned monetarist uh, reasoning uh, we all know uh, economists, we all have dear friends uh, who embarrassed themselves and embarrassed us by pointing out that uh, if the central bank uh, multiplies the size of its balance sheet by three or four or five within some short period of time, this would of course lead to a trebling or a quadrupling or a quintupling not just of the inflation rate, but of the price level. Uh, this was, of course, never to be believed in the first place, but some people did believe it, and worse yet, some people said it. It, of course, turned out to be wrong. This, uh, this uh, fallacy uh, is not identical to, pol to populism, but historically there has been a strong affinity between populist movements and crude monetarism. Uh, I don't think anybody has explored why this is true. Fixation with currency arrangements has been a staple of populist thinking for uh, the last two centuries. Uh, 
And so there is, there is something there. What is valid, to repeat from before, is that these programs have had and continue to have significant distributional implications, and people don't like that. How about challenges to supervision and regulation? At least viewed from an American perspective, I would say not yet. Not yet. But there are grounds for concern. I leave it to my two colleagues on the panel to say whether that conclusion would hold for Europe. But there are <clears throat> uh, grounds for concern. Uh, one ground for concern is the potential for the kind of political, financial corruption. Uh, I don't mean uh, indirect corruption. I mean capital C corruption that we have seen many, many times. The poster child was uh, Charles Keating a few decades ago who paid five senators to block uh, regula regulators uh, from uh, enforcing the rules on him. But I think in many forms, the current situation uh, runs great risks. In the United States, we now have the frightening situation in which the elected chief executive of the country identifies specific businesses and specific businessmen as enemies of the people. Now, to date, American bankers, who have a historical memory comparable to that of the fruit fly, have not reacted. But this is, I think, a failure of historical understanding. Uh, I am guessing that anybody in this room is quite prepared to uh, recall uh, the idea that the enemy of the people could be the banks and the bankers, and by extension, the enemy of the people could be the central bankers. Think about what it would mean, for example, if the next president of the United States used the phrase failing Citibank as frequently as our current president uses the phrase failing New York Times. Think about what it would mean in the market if the next president were to use the phrase fake money JP Morgan as frequently as the current president uses the phrase fake news CNN. This is not outside of the bounds of uh, possibility. Finally, here in Europe, and again, I defer to my colleagues, uh, there is the anomaly <clears throat> of this uh, single supervisory and uh, resolution mechanism, of which I hope everyone in this room is justly uh, proud. Viewed from afar, this is a marvelous achievement. And Ignacio, I again congratulate you, but I congratulate uh, European, uh, the European community more generally. But the problem is there is no money behind it. There is no, there is no serious EU money behind this. And we shall see whether that turns out to be a problem. Third on the list, what about uh, last resort lending? This has already happened. We don't have to speculate. In the United States, this has already happened. Section 1101 of the Dodd-Frank Act amended Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act so that much of what the Federal Reserve did to stem runs during the crisis cannot now be done without a signed permission slip from the Secretary of the Treasury. One could, of course, say, why does this matter? Because the Secretary of the Treasury would, of course, grant permission. I think this is not at all, this is not, this is not at all uh, guaranteed. One could also say that this doesn't matter because the amendment to Section 13.3 did not apply to banks. It only applies to non-banks. This is not comforting. There's something somewhere between 10 and $13 trillion of runnable short-term liabilities owed by U.S. domiciled institutions that are not banks and therefore that are now excluded under Section 1101 from exactly the kind of lending that the Federal Reserve did during the last uh, crisis. Uh, what about Europe? Well, I defer to my colleagues on the panel. <laughs>
Finally, what about the broader issue, not of policy making, but of the governance and legitimacy of central banking? Uh, as Paul Tucker, among many other people, have pointed out, there are generic concerns on political theory grounds for the um, legitimacy of any kind of quasi-independent policy-making institution, and central banks may be the only, may be the most obvious example, but they are not the only example. I think, however, that both in my country and here in Europe, there are some very specific vulnerabilities of the central bank that go beyond the usual uh, political theory issues. Uh, the Federal Reserve System is a very peculiar animal. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands on how many people know this, but it turns out that the Federal Reserve banks not the board, but the banks are privately owned. They are owned by the commercial banks. Now, most of us in this room would know that this matter is not one iota. It just doesn't matter. But if you go to the kind of uh, websites that uh, the current quasi-populist movement uh, inhabits and uh, go to Federal Reserve, what you will find is the statement that the fact that the Federal Reserve banks are owned by the share owners surely means that their role is to act into the profit-making interest of their share owners. That's what entities that are uh, owned privately uh, do. These are the same uh, websites that uh, populate the usual uh, or inhabit the usual populist uh, space. They will, uh, they will assure you that um, they will assure you that Jay Powell is a Jew. The, there, there's the whole the whole range of standard populist pathologies. It also turns out that the boards of directors of these privately held banks are uh, two thirds of them consist of bankers. And worse yet, it turns out that the boards of directors of these privately held Federal Reserve banks select the presidents of the banks, who in turn, without any confirmation from the US Senate, serve in policy-making capacities on the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, we may not take this seriously at all, but it is a real uh, vulnerability. And the last com comment on my own country's situation is that the congressional oversight of Federal Reserve policy uh, has been historically weak and continues to be so. This matters because under Article I, Section 8 of the US Constitution, it's very clear that the monetary policy power uh, is delegated to the Congress. And so everything that the Federal Reserve does, it does by delegation from the Congress and is certainly subject to oversight uh, by congressional authority. Here in Europe, I think the issues uh, are somewhat similar and somewhat uh, different. Uh, an American perspective is that part of the ECB's political problem stems not from anything specific to the ECB, but to the uh, top-down uh, I'll say non-democratic instead of anti-democratic character of the European project uh, as a whole. Uh, I would hope that even in a room of Europeans, uh, most people are aware of the opening words of the US Constitution. It famously starts off, we the people, meaning that the power that created this new republic uh, came from the people. Uh, do people recall the opening words of the uh, proposed European constitution that uh, eventually was not adopted? I'm seeing lots of blank stares, and so I would, I, I would, I would, I would have thought the European. The king. It started off, His Majesty the, the king, king of Belgium. Mm. Well, and this is an issue. It started off, His Majesty the King of Belgium because the conceit was that instead of the American example, uh, 
in which the power from which this new republic sprang was the people, the European Union was a uh, project that was being granted by the, not just the heads of government, the heads of state of the member countries, and they were listed in alphabetical order, and so the first person up in Tibet was the King of Belgium. Well, one could go on in this vein, but the, the difference between a bottom-up and a top-down union is very clear, and I think this is, of course, not the ECB's fault, but the ECB is collateral damage in this battle. Part of the uh, problem of the ECB, I think, that is shared by the uh, with the Federal Reserve is the absence of effective uh, oversight. I understand that there are hearings at which uh, the president of the ECB testifies in uh, uh, Strasbourg or Brussels or wherever it happens to be taking place. This is no uh, comfort. There are hearings at which the chairman of the Federal Reserve testifies before the relevant congressional committees, and uh, this, not, this is not very uh, impressive. And finally, here at the ECB, in a problem that uh, you have that we don't, do not, is the uh, complete non-transparency of the appointment uh, process. Uh, in the United States, for better or worse, candidates are appointed by the president, uh, and that's what it is. Whereas here, because of the multi <clears throat> the multi-country aspect, uh, there is a behind-the-scenes horse trading aspect to EC, the ECB appointment process, uh, which runs against the grain of today's so-called populism or any uh, populism. Uh, let me conclude by again saluting you, uh, Ignacio. Uh, you have been, you are a great friend whom we all admire, respect, uh, love. Uh, you have been, you are a great uh, civil servant who's shown that there is such thing as integrity and it is possible to live a life in the public sphere with integrity. Uh, and uh, you have been and you are a great European patriot. So I salute you for all of those and uh, to quote uh, Cicero, Ave Aque Wale. Well, I will start by, <clears throat> by first thanking Ignacio for, for inviting me to this conference. In fact, you didn't really invite me. Uh, you summoned me uh, to this uh, conference, saying that, um, I, well, I won't say exactly what you said, but um, uh, being, being my supervisor, I, of course, I was, um, I was forced to come. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I would say because he said, uh, well, it's partly your fault if I'm here, uh, if I've been here, uh, which is true. Um, we've been known each other for many years since I joined the Bank of Italy. We were together at the Monetary Policy Subcommittee chaired by, by Lucas. Uh, I don't know how you, Lucas, saw the two of us uh, working together, but uh, certainly I learned a lot from Ignazio. And then um, I was at the uh, European Monetary Institute uh, for four years and when the, with many people uh, that are in this room. When the ECB started, uh, I thought for personal reasons, I wanted to go back to, to Italy. And I went to, to talk to Tommaso Pavaschioppa saying, uh, listen, um, I think I should go back uh, to Italy for several reasons. I said, you know, you're crazy. I mean, the, there are already f very few Italians uh, if you leave. Uh, I mean, the only way to live is if you get somebody smarter than you. Um, that they, and you know, even if he's Italian, at least uh, you know there would be no doubt that uh, there are problems of nationality. Just go and find if you can. And so I thought, you know, who can be really smarter than than, than I am? And after five minutes, um, I, I called Ignazio and and I, I talked him into that. Um, I don't know if uh, if in the end it worked out. I think for you uh, and it worked out for me. Um, in spite of my ego, I could accept. <laughs> I think it was uh, something uh, I think good for the ECB, and uh, 
and for the, the SSM. So uh, this is to say that uh, I, I have a lot of uh, affection uh, for you, and I think we worked um, together very well. I, I think Ben Friedman's um, uh, uh, speech and, and, and paper was very interesting. I, I think you, 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 you didn't mention one thing, which was why did Andrew Jackson uh, not renew the, 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 for the, the, the and, to exactly. And the, the, the interesting thing, and I mentioned this to, to, uh, to Mario Draghi, said after 20 years, you have become too powerful. Uh, which is uh, a way to say you're the only game in town, we would say today, no? and so it's better to get rid of these unelected politicians, um, unelected uh, technocrats, because they have too much power. And this is one of the risks. I will come back to that uh, uh, later, later on. Uh, the other comment I would mention is try to resist, um, when, you are, when you come from the US, reading European integration only through US history, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, that the um, appointment, just for, as an example, the appointment of the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman is transparent because the president decides. I mean, it's a kind of a strange concept of, uh, of transparency. It's true that here we are not that transparent, but at least uh, uh, we know that I think uh, we rely, as Jean-Claude Trichet would say, on the wisdom of the head of state, um, and which is more or less relying on the wisdom of Mr. Trump. Um, <laughs> So maybe just um, just going, uh, do I have my presentation on? Um, no? Oh, there's no presentation. We didn't have one. Ah, okay, yeah, so we didn't co work out well <laughs> together, but <laughs> this is the first time. In any case, so don't worry. Um, I had only a, sm a couple of small um, uh, things. I, what I want to mention is I think we have a good um, – basis for understanding independence of central banks for monetary policy. There is a lot of literature, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, empirical evidence comparing the Bundesbank uh, with other central banks. We have actually the experience of the ECB until the crisis. And I think uh, this, um, uh, this, this uh, I think until the crisis was something that few people would, would, uh, would criticize. Uh, but with the crisis, uh, I think there are much, much more questions. And um, uh, one of the issues is that uh, we have not been able to achieve really price stability. We are struggling. Inflation is still below uh, uh, the 2%, uh, much below, much more below. Growth is still fragile. Uh, there are inequalities, and some people would say that uh, the way in which monetary policy has been implemented uh, uh, no, don't worry. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, my presentation had only a couple of, um, of slides. Um, so the issue has become, has come back to the fore. I mean, uh, and I would want to, to mention a couple of, of issues uh, that are key in maintaining independence. Um, but uh, to be sure, central banks have become more powerful after the crisis. They, uh, because they are the only game in town, uh, they have adopted new instruments and they have become more responsible on supervisory issues. Uh, and this is not true only in Europe, it's true for the Fed, it's true for the Bank of England who got back supervision. And so um, the issue of independence for supervisors is even more uh, important. But it is, in my view, uh, in spite of the contributions that have been made in the literature, it is it has less of an analytical framework to support it. Second, uh, what is key in my view in the central bank independence for monetary policy, which is a key objective, price stability, then even in the US framework, in the end, it can be interpreted as, in any case, monetary stability. In the, um, in the supervisory aspect, it is financial stability. And you could actually, if you read the mandate of the ECB, it's uh, banking, stability of the banking system, as you read this morning, uh, but you have also integration of the European banking system. And that's a much more complex element to assess uh, and to, to calibrate what is banking stability. 
And can you really um, identify a result as you know, being a good result or a bad result, as you can with inflation? It's much, much more complicated. And um, I think uh, this morning, um, uh, and uh, the, the other element is that there is no trade-off in the long term for monetary policy, inflation and growth. This whole concept that you can separate inflation and growth, that there is no trade-off. And you can ask yourself, is there a trade-off, at least for some time, between financial stability or banking stability and growth, for instance? This morning, uh, Ignacio, you mentioned that in the end, uh, the, um, the decision on the appropriate risk return um, characteristic of the banking system is up for the politicians to decide, for the, for the, reg for the legislature. Uh, the problem uh, that I, and then you said the politician, the people, and the people are made of taxpayers and depositors. Well, I would say uh, it is a bit more complicated in my experience. First, people hold deposits, but they hold many other financial assets. And the people who go to Philip uh, to get not zero return, they want return. And Philip mentioned this morning he will not invest in banks unless they have a good return on capital. In particular, unless they have a return on capital which is higher than the cost of capital. So in the end, the trade-off uh, that you have in society is also in our society, which is very wealthy, has a lot of wealth, in the end, it is also made of people who want to have a remuneration on their own savings, a high remuneration. And so if you are not able to deliver, in the end, they will disinvest from the banking system. And I have a nice chart here, but it doesn't matter. You can imagine it. If you compare, uh, this morning it was mentioned, the capitalization of banks in the US and Europe, you see a clear bifurcation. And if you see what is the consequence of that, well, if you look at credit to the real economy, it's the same bifurcation. Uh, it's not as dramatic, it doesn't decrease in Europe, it's more or less in the end, we are in 2018, back to the levels of 2007, so credit has been stable, while in the US it has increased by 40%. So the banking system in the US, the US which is not a bancocentric system, has increased dramatically in Europe, which is a bancocentric system, credit has remained constant. It's very efficient uh, here the, in real time. Um, so this, as a society, you have to ask yourself, uh, do, that, do I have the right combination of risk uh, return? Uh, and, and my um, regulatory, regulatory framework, is it appropriate for uh, the kind of growth that you need to support the economy and to fight populism, because in the end, populism emerges if you don't have growth. Uh, let's see, yeah, that's very good, very efficient. Yeah, I wanted just to, to show you because I, mean, I want to. So credit uh, to the real economy, the red is the Eurozone, and, uh, and the, the gray is, uh, is the US. S the smart ones of you would say, but this is the demand determined. But then I show the market financing. And you see that the red, uh, even, even though the capital market in Europe is smaller, you've seen how much it has grown. So the demand was very strong for financing, uh, and therefore the hypothesis that this bad performance in Europe was partly due to the supply side, so to a weak banking system, cannot be really rejected, I think, or it has to be taken into account. So in light of what we have, maybe we have to consider whether this trade-off uh, really uh, between uh, growth and, uh, and stability is the, appropriate, is the appropriate one. And over time, this is a risk. I will mention this. This is a risk to the independence of, of, uh, of the regulator and of the ECB. Let me, let me conclude uh, a final point. What, what are the main risks, again, to, to independence in Europe? Well, in Europe, there is an additional 
dimension, I think, which is trust that the institutions are doing what they do for the interest of Europe, not of the various national countries. And uh, I think Andrea and Ria mentioned this uh, this, uh, this morning. In my view, one of the greatest threats or greatest um, uh, blows to independence is when the national authorities have started to uh, distance themselves from the decision of the ECB. And uh, I can uh, think about two examples. One is 2010 on monetary policy, and the other is 2017 on supervisory, uh, on supervisory issues. I will not give the detail so that, you know, the Chatham House rule is not... Uh, these are two central banks who have distanced themselves clearly from a decision on monetary policy, a decision on supervisory policy, who have given the impression that the decisions are taken uh, for national uh, um, uh, objectives rather than a European objective. I think this is the biggest threat in Europe, and it is up to the central bank and uh, the single supervisor to try to discipline and to try really to construct a cohesive mechanism so that the people where they in Italy or in Germany think that whatever decision is made is really made for the interests of Europe, not against them or in favor of somebody else. I think I gave enough hints to, for you to understand what were these two decisions. Um, but I think this is the biggest threat. It is uh, within the system, I think, uh, because when uh, you look uh, at the overall result of monetary policy and even of supervisory, it has really been I think quite successful. You can always improve it. Quite successful. The main, uh, the main fear, I think, comes from the inside. So uh, I hope your successors will be uh, as wise as you, uh, Ignazio, in your job. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you very much, Ignazio, for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, among, especially in, in this uh, very distinguished audience, as well as my panel, uh, fellow panel members. Um, I, I came across Ignazio fa fairly late on compared to the rest of you, which is, was 2012 when we started doing the work for the SSM. And my, I, I think largely the credit for the SSM being set up so quickly in Moscow at least a lot of it, to Ignacio. I just could not believe how much progress there was from one meeting to the next. Because Ignacio was reporting to us in uh, um, informal dinners here in this building, top floor, and every few weeks we had some massive manuals coming in which um, really raised the question, how quickly are, are these people working? And of course, he was uh, chairing that task force. Obviously, um, a lot, a lot um, of credit and uh, to Ignazio for all that work. So what I'm going to do, in fact, in some sense I'm very pleased because a lot of the things I was going to say have already been one way or another covered, but there are, there are uh, at least three issues that I haven't been and I want to sort of, uh, to sort of uh, discuss a little bit. Um, so clearly the um, presentation by Ben Friedman, absolutely outstanding. I could agree with nearly everything there. Uh, I have uh, just a few, a few points that I, 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 I sort of take issue with. And one was, well, the strong language at least he used when he described the ECB as a mechanism, uh, um, part of the enforcement mechanism for financial exploitation by rescued creditors. And of course, we've seen it. I'm, I'm sure it's perceived like that in many countries, including my own country, that's how the ECB was perceived, right? And of course, I did try to explain, in fact, in the presence of uh, the president and uh, others in Cyprus, that it's not like that. But I don't think I quite <laughs> succeeded just to explain how the ECB has to play by, its, by the rules, and in fact, by the treaty and by, um, well, the, the law that is there to provide um, liquidity to banks in trouble, right? So. Then again, when you have a narrative created by a president which says the ECB put a, a gun on my head, I think people kind of 
believe that that's true, a lot of people at least. Right. So it is a perception which I, I would argue is wrong, but uh, as I said, it's very hard to, to actually explain why it is wrong. Um, now, in terms of challenges to supervision and regulation, I think we have seen plenty in Europe, a lot of challenges, and that's partly, I think, because we've started applying bail-in. In fact, um, Cyprus was one of them, but also Slovenia, uh, Spain, Portugal, etc. So every time there are investors who are hit, there is a reaction, and there is, of course, a challenge. The pattern is a challenge to the estimates of the stress tests, be it the EBA stress test or whoever tests stress test or is the National Central Bank stress test or whatever. There's always a challenge, and of course this is where, um, I, I mean, many of us have been very careful with them, but nevertheless, it's inevitable. So partly because a bailout hides so many sins, right? A bail-in doesn't hide them, and inevitably, you get the hit. And in the front line, it's the institutions that do that. And it has been, in Europe at least, in the periphery, it has been the central banks. So it's been a big challenge. Uh, when it comes to uh, LLR lending, yes, we've also had challenges. And in fact, Cyprus is another example there. We had uh, all kinds of police investigations. We had uh, uh, witch hunts. We had inquiries into, into this. And in fact, I do, this is, if, if you excuse me, a commercial break, it's all in my book on uh, the first, the first book that I wrote on the diary of the Euro crisis in Cyprus. So there have been, there has been a lot there, a lot of challenge. Now, I would also argue that, you know, oversight, absence of EU oversight, I don't find it that obvious, right, that, that there is, and I, I don't see how you can square that circle. Yes, is it not enough to go to European Parliament? Is it not enough to go to national parliaments? Maybe not enough is happening. I mean, the SSM, as I understand, could and should go to national parliaments. I don't think they've done it very much, but I think that's a practice that needs to be encouraged when it comes to supervision, not when it comes to monetary policy, which is common, obviously, but certainly when it comes to supervision. Right, I think the general problem is, as I felt also, during my short time as governor, that you're very much an easy target. Whether you want to call them populists or not, the politicians basically have access to the media. Um, they have um, a natural following, right? They have basically groups behind them, interest groups, who have helped them get across their messages, whatever they are. Settled banks inevitably cannot, need not, should not perhaps engage in political debates, right? But when the politicians are putting across fallacies or fake news, what do they do? Do you just sit there and allow that to continue? So you need to develop a strategy to cope with that. And I'm not saying you should respond to them, but there should be some form of communication strategy that responds to that. So otherwise, you're in a lose-lose situation. Right, because if you, don't, if you don't react, then there is a danger that you're basically guilty as charged, and then when they start changing the, the laws, which they will, right, then you lose your independence. And I mean, we've experienced that um, in Cyprus when the law was changed um, with the central bank governance law. And of course, there, were, there was a legal opinion by the ECB, but the, you know, the people in Cyprus didn't look at it. Um, so. If, the, if you do engage, and in fact we have, we have examples from, from the UK, on Mark Carney makes comments on Brexit, and he was just attacked. So it's a big challenge, and I don't really have um, the answers. But there's no doubt that the public understanding of what the central banks are doing needs to be improved. And of course, stakeholders, and who are the stakeholders? Not just the parliaments, it's not just the politicians, it's the public at large. So central bank transparency and communication are now more, much more important than ever, I, I think. So I believe there has to be a constant dialogue. It's got to be systematic. And it's not just a one-off conference after the monetary policy decisions. When it comes to the SSM, I, I, I didn't see much in the last few years in terms of the, the communication. But certainly um, opening up, to the, especially to the younger generations who, are, who hold the future, is much more important than ever. Right? So I think that central banks need to need to do a lot more. And of course, 
Uh, one aspect that Ben um, touched upon and I, I, I sort of agree with is, is the appointment process, not just of the ECB, um, the executive board, but generally in the euro system. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. Now, the definition, I think, I, don't, I think you all know, have seen this before, and um, this is basically the, the treaty, so I'm, I'm just going to skip that. And this is the interpretation of it by Yves Mersch, who is now the executive board member in charge of legal, right? And um, this is from a paper, or from a speech he gave. And it's a very narrow definition, and the justification he gives, and basically limits himself to itself to monetary policy. So supervision sort of stays in a, in a bit of a limbo, right? Um, so basically because of the definition, it's much easier when it comes to price stability to define what is the objective and to be accountable to it. And I appreciate that. But does it mean we leave supervision unprotected? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's right. But we still have that big problem that others have referred to uh, this morning. Uh, what, one other aspect uh, I think that people fail to notice is that the treaty only protects central bank governors, right? It doesn't protect deputy governors. It doesn't protect members of the, the boards of national central banks. Um, so enforcement has been problematic, or even of the treaty, in several countries. And I give three examples there. Um, Cyprus, Slovenia... Um, and Latvia, and they are, I think two of them have, gin, have been to sort of court, European courts, or I think Commission is now taking action on Slovenia from what I've read. Um, okay, so wh wh where is the problem? Where do I see the problem moving forward? What, what I see gradually is happening is that governments um, are working through the central bank boards, right, political capture basically of the boards. So. Um, and, and of course, the fact that the SSM, when the SSM has been in operation for five years, is an easy target for politicians. I've seen it in Cyprus again as another example. I have no difficulty saying it in public because I've said it already in public. The failure of the co-op bank in Cyprus, which was very recent, um, the co-op bank was bailed out with public money in 2013, right? It was controlled more or less by the government, and um, there was an inquiry, and the inquiry, eight, 800 pages long, a judicial inquiry, a proper inquiry, and basically ascribed a lot of the blame to the government. <laughs> Nevertheless, the government comes out and attacks the SSM for all kinds of uh, changing the, um, basically the rules or changing the goalposts, etc. So basically, the SSM has been scapegoated once again. So it's, it's, it's the same pattern. So Europe to blame for uh, sort of failures at home. Now, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention is this, because I think that's, that's been completely ignored, and I haven't heard of any of this so far. We have fit and proper rules for commercial bank boards. We don't have anything like it or any processes, in fact, in many euro area countries. So what we end up having is sometimes people who are not fit and proper to sit on a commercial bank board, end up on a central bank board. And I think that's just wrong, right? And especially if it's, they could also be members of the governing council, right? And we've had that. So that's, we need, it's, unless uh, central banks fix, um, you know, uh, put the house in order, I think it's very difficult to, to, to actually have more understanding of, of what they're doing. And of course this is, needs to be addressed uh, politically. There's another aspect that this is I'm working on right now because that's not, yeah, this is my last slide. And I think it's, it's, it's an important one. Uh, it's political money laundering. Somebody mentioned this morning about corruption, right? Now, how widespread is this? We've seen a lot of cases of money laundering coming through in Europe, right? And there are many angles to it and how it interacts with central banks. But one of the most important uh, aspects here is that the SSM has no responsibility for anti-money laundering supervision. It remains in the hands of national member states, so it is highly, highly vulnerable in Europe. So things need to change and they need to change quickly because 
if it's not just populism, uh, what I see is not just populism, populism, it's also it could be related to that, right? It's capture and it's, it's dirty money with a purpose. Thank you. Okay, so we've it's had very nice. three good, good very nice. thoughtful presentations, probably not as disciplined as I hoped there would be. <laughs> That's well. okay, it's given us a lot of food for thought. Now, since I'm conscious of time, I'm just gonna jump straight to the questions from the floor. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. I see one from Daniel, one from Rosa, and one uh, over there. Uh, and then we'll get some answers. So to start from Daniel Groves from. Well, people were going back and forth between monetary policy and supervision. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether we should take it as a given that the central bank does both, yeah. especially in the European context. And uh, maybe Ben could give us also some historic perspective on whether what we have right now, which actually was an accident of history in 2012 when our leader said, we need banking union quickly. Yeah. They look around and the only credible institution which could yeah. do it quickly was the ECB. Yeah. Should we in Europe not think about that and maybe change that? Ah. Okay, okay, uh, that, that's okay. No, no. Okay, yes. um, my point, I have a couple of brief points, or relatively brief points. One is with regard to the interpretation that MERS, if MERS did in 2017, I mean, that was the opinion that he had, but it's not necessarily the interpretation of the ECV on its own mandate, because Article 130 of the mm -hmm. Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union specifically says that when exercising its functions and tasks, all the tasks that are conferred upon the ECB. So the treaty itself actually does not limit the independence to the ambit of monetary policy, even though if MERS in that speech made that declaration. But anyway, it is just the declaration of one of the members of the governing council. So again, this gives the, the reason a little bit to the speech that Ignacio Angeloni did this morning with regard to independence. The other point <coughs> concerns the the issue that Ben Friedman mentioned in his absolutely excellent speech about lender of last resort. Because uh, Ignacio Angeloni also said in a speech uh, recently, earlier this year, that in banking union we have one pillar and a half. The one pillar is SSM and then half is single resolution because we are still in the process, like you say, we don't have sufficient funds and even the, the building up of the single resolution fund will take up and up until 2022, but you know, and we don't have deposit insurance either. But one of the pillars that we do not have in banking union is lender of last resort, and that is because of a restrictive interpretation that the executive board of the European Central Bank made of its own competences back at the beginning of the system. But in principle, as some, uh, some people have argued, including myself, that the ECB could provide not only market liquidity assistance, which it does but individual liquidity assistance to institutions which at the moment are subject to the ELA of the national central banks, albeit uh, with a complicated procedure, which I know you know well, Panikos, because they need to have the fiat of the governing council, and if the governing council says no more, then there is no more. This creates additional problems for resolution because the ECB has the power to cut the, the tap of the water, and then put the institution effectively into resolution. Sure. So I'd like to have the comments from the audience. And also to talk about oversight, uh, the judicial review, there is judicial review of ECB monetary policy. Yeah, okay, good. And finally. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Klaus Masuch. Um, I just want to say to Ignacio, uh, congratulations for this wonderful uh, conference, excellent panels. On uh, my question, uh, it's both uh, to Benjamin Friedman. You said that, that the ECB was instrumental in helping uh, creditors from the north to, say, to avoid a, uh, debt restructuring, to get their money back. Can you, can you explain a bit? Uh, because it's not so clear what 
uh, the role of the ECB was and what the role of the member states was in this, uh, how, you, how you see this. Um, and to, to the um, to Panikos Demetriadis, thanks a lot for, for the presentation. I think there, there are very many uh, thought, uh, very good thoughts in this. And it, it brought me back to what we discussed in the morning about the quality of institutions in member states and, uh, and where Guido's uh, Tabellini's presentation, where we can integrate and how we can integrate. Let me, it's more a comment, but I, I like your reaction. How can we have a functioning European uh, integration if somebody like Bostian, uh, who, who does what the European rules are saying, is hunted in, in Slovenia because the oligarchs who were bailed in uh, are also controlling the press? How can we have a fun functioning European uh, Union and integration if the chief statistician in, in um, Greece, Andreas Georgiou, who did nothing but implementing European rules, is hunted time and again in front of Greek courts and has no chance to appeal to a European court? So how can we so solve, if these basic problems for people working for Europe are not solved, how can we make That's progress? Thank you. Okay. I think we'll leave it there. Um, I also have a final question which I'd like to ask before, uh, which is in, I don't know whether this is, it's something which one can do here, if it's polite or not, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In a few months' time, this institution will change its head, <laughs> uh, which is possibly the biggest decision which uh, one can make about central banks, and it's a democratic decision because it comes from governments. So, at a time of rising populism and challenges to central bank, what is your advice to the people who are going to make that decision when they're going to choose who the successor to the current president is? Um, so that's my final question. Uh, I will start, let's go in the opposite direction. So uh, let's start with you and you answer whatever question which has been answered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, points are well taken um, and, and, and obviously a lot has to do with legal interpretation but if sits on the governing council on the executive board so it's got a lot of weight how he interprets um, the ECB sort of um, um, protection of independence and of course there is protection of independence for supervision but only limited one it's not it's only for the members the ECB members on the supervisory board or the other members on the supervisory board have no protection of their personal independence. So always interpretation on everything. So that's, that's, um, that's important. Going straight to, to your question, I think, which is, I think is, is relevant to this, because it's how you interpret your role, right? How do you get the best person to lead the ECB? Is it going to be with horse, tra horse trading between Germany and, uh, and France? And, um, I, I don't think so. I, I just don't think that that's going to produce. And if we wanted to a, a major shift towards greater transparency, this is the time to do it. Open it up like they do in the, in the UK, right? And, and then, of course... And they end up with a Canadian. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if he's a Canadian, right? Yes. He's free, well, no? By Ju in June, sorry? he's free, so he could... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just... I, I think that there is no... Uh, basically, there's very little legitimacy left in Europe at this stage with all the appointments that just are the result of horse trading. If we continue like this, all, all is going to happen is just going to fuel all these, all these guys who are at the margins, are either extreme left or extreme right. So I know it's a big, a big uh, step to take, but certainly I, I think that, um, that would be an, a very important one. They're not going to do it, of course. It's just wishful. Um, thank you. If Maybe I, you want to answer. Yeah, if I can, because we wrote a piece together uh, 20 years ago, and we were in favor of separating, uh, and I changed my mind, uh, maybe uh, in light of experience. But I think one of, uh, of the answers is, is, is linked to the question of land of last resort. What we found ourselves during the crisis is that we were providing uh, uh, lending to banks uh, that were not solvent based on the, on the uh, certification by the local supervisor that they were solvent, which they were not, because of course there is an incentive by the local supervisor to say, yes, don't, don't worry, just continue lending, uh, unless, until you get out of uh, good collateral. Now the point is that if you are logical in this reasoning, now that the supervision has come to DCB, lender of last resort should be centralized and shared. Sure. So the risk of lending uh, uh, to uh, 
banks which are solvent but do not have enough collateral should be, should be shared. I think that I, I would agree with you, and this would be at least a, a reflection in the, um, in the ECB. I, I think if I can uh, answer your question, I will not say. I think um, if we had an experience of European nominations which were disastrous, I would say, you know, it's time to change. Now, I will uh, not comment, but I think we didn't, and I think the recent decisions have, have really been relatively good. So before saying we need to change, and as uh, Jean-Claude Tachet would say, uh, we rely on the wisdom of the heads of state and government, um, which the US does, because they rely on the wisdom of a single person. But, uh, and, and in the end, that wisdom has not given uh, particularly bad results. So I think, I, I think I would not, uh, uh, I mean, the, the process is not transparent. I don't think it is transparent necessarily in other places. I don't think we, we can go in the British uh, solution. But uh, I think, I think uh, we, we need to accept that this is part of a political process. And po politics is about horse trading, I mean, within countries or, or without. Now, the issue is nationality and so forth. But I, I, I think I would, uh, I would want to see a major mistake before saying we need to, to, to change. And I think uh, European appointments, maybe I should not say that, but European appointments have on quality been relatively better than national. Uh, let me just drop this little provocation. Okay. Lots of provocations from, uh, Ignat from, from Lorenzo today for those who want to understand them. And finally. Okay, I think there were two questions directed toward me. One was Daniel's question about combining monetary policy functions and supervision and regulation functions. Uh, our country's uh, regime in this regard is not uh, anything, I think, to be uh, recommended. We have had this very fragmented system, historically, in which bank holding companies were regulated by the Federal Reserve. Banks might be regulated by the controller of the currency. State banks might be regulated at the state level. There's also an involvement of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. My view has been <clears throat> that the Federal Reserve is the dominant regulator in terms of two features. One is competence. Uh, the Federal Reserve is simply more competent than any of these others, or all of them put together. And second, I think the Federal Reserve is less subject to regulatory capture by the industry. This is especially a problem at the state level, but even the controller of the currency. Uh, these decisions are not in the hands of the chairman of the Federal Reserve. They're also the Federal Reserve Bank presidents do not play a role. They're in the hands of the Federal Reserve boards, so that's seven people. Uh, they have staggered terms. It's very difficult for some president to install a majority that is going to be captive to the banks. So if you combine the structural advantages uh, with the uh, historic record, record of competence, uh, my own view is that any time these functions are transferred from somebody else to the Federal Reserve, that's a step in the right uh, direction. This is very idiosyncratic to uh, the US. On the question of what I have in mind in the uh, exploitation of the southern countries, um, various uh, banks, mostly uh, domiciled in northern European countries uh, held credits on countries domiciled in the south. And everybody understood at, after some point that these credits were not going to be good credits. And so five minutes before the default occurred, the bonds were transferred from the balance sheet of the lenders who had been happy to collect the interest as well as the fees on the loans all this period of time. Five minutes before the default occurred, the bonds were transferred to the balance sheets of various official lenders uh, whose policy, understandably, is that if the official sector doesn't take default, doesn't take 
default losses. Now, uh, how did that then play out? Then there is this uh, triumvirate, uh, tripartite, uh, whatever, uh, which imposed on the uh, borrowers uh, certain uh, obligations in return for restructuring, rolling over these bonds which could not uh, default. And I'll simply offer the contrast to the 1953 uh, London Debt Agreement, which restructured Germany's debt. As I hope everybody in the room understands, the country in the world that has had more debt restructuring than any other country within the last century is Germany. I'll say it again. The country in the world that has had more uh, debt forgiveness than any other country in the world is Germany. Now, the, there was the, all these various agreements throughout the 20s and the 30s. Uh, the major part of the agreement was the London Debt Agreement in 1953, which had as an explicit feature that the restructuring of the debt was not to involve any provision that would impair the cost, uh, that would impair the living standard of the German public. Contrast that with the conditions uh, imposed on, uh, on Greece. Uh, you know, we, we must follow rules is the notion, is the rubric, but the rules that apply when Germany can't pay its bills are different rules from the rules that apply when somebody other, some other country can't pay its bills. So this is what I have in mind. And you could have imagined a regime <clears throat> in which the central bank would not have been part of this apparatus, but in fact, it played out in a way that the ECB was part of the apparatus. That I've written about this, so there, well, there's lots there, but in, in brief, that's what I meant. Well, I'm sure we could have an entire new discussion on this <laughs> last statement by uh, Professor Friedman, but I think we should draw it to a close because we are running out of time. So I would like you to uh, join me in thanking uh, the panel for a very thoughtful and provocative discussion. Thank you. Well done. Well done.